Hello and thank you for joining us for Witness TV. I'm your host, Rachel Bryson. On today's show, we have a recap of the installation of Archbishop Nelson J. Perez, and then take a trip to Duncannon to explore what happens during a pastoral visit. Al Ganoza from the Pennsylvania Catholic Conference then joins us with our update from the Capitol where budget talks continue. But first up this week, Bishop Gaynor announced this past Wednesday that the diocese has filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection. He now joins us with a special message. Hello, this is Bishop Ronald Gaynor, and I'm speaking with you today to address the Roman Catholic Diocese of Harrisburg's decision to file for bankruptcy under Chapter 11 of the United States Bankruptcy Code. Known as reorganization bankruptcy, this plan will allow us to continue the work of the church in our diocese while equitably compensating our creditors. Over the past few years, our diocese has been forced to confront our horrific past regarding clergy sexual abuse. Today, we are facing some difficult financial realities. Despite making every attempt to scale back our operations and reduce overhead, we are currently unable to meet our financial obligations. This decision was made after countless hours of prayer and careful deliberation with our financial experts, attorneys, and our diocesan consultative bodies. The overwhelming reality is that for a number of years, prior to receiving the grand jury subpoena in 2016, the diocesan finances were in a very challenging condition. Responding to that investigation forced us to incur very heavy legal costs, which has had harsh financial consequences for the diocese. These costs were not something the diocese was able to plan for in our budget, which greatly limited the options available to us to correct the pre-existing financial trend. Our current financial situation, coupled with the changes in the law both here and in New Jersey, where we are already named in one lawsuit and where we anticipate more to follow, left us with no other path forward to ensure the future of our diocese. Despite the success of our survivor compensation program, which helped 111 survivors of clergy child sexual abuse or 96% of those who participated in the program, we already are in receipt of a half a dozen new lawsuits, any one of which could bankrupt the diocese. As bishop, I must ensure the diocese's core mission is upheld, which is to remain focused on Christ's mandate to preach, teach, sanctify, and to serve those in need. We must work to bring the Chapter 11 process to a conclusion as soon as is reasonably possible and in a way that allows us to be present to the community as we have been for the past 152 years. When I think about our current situation and the future, I cannot help but think about what it will take to rebuild and strengthen our diocese as we move forward. You cannot build anything without a strong and solid foundation. As we read in Luke's Gospel, chapter 6, verse 48, he is like a man building a house who dug deeply and laid the foundation on rock. When the flood came, the rivers burst against that house and could not shake it because it had been well built. Our diocese currently lacks that strong foundation. However, at the end of this difficult process, we will again have a solid foundation to build upon. I know that this decision raises many questions. To help answer those questions, we have created a special page on our website about our path forward to a more vibrant and secure future as we look to lay a foundation to build upon. This page has several resources, including some frequently asked questions and court documents. Please visit www.hbgdiocese.org to learn more about this process 
And please know that we will update this information throughout this process as we move forward. I humbly ask for your prayers for our diocese, our clergy, for each other, for me and for my advisors as we move forward through this journey towards a stronger foundation to build upon. Well, the diocese will continue to provide updates on this process as we move forward. Well, this past weekend, Bishop Gaynor made a pastoral visit to St. Bernadette's Parish in Duncannon. Now, a pastoral visit gives the local parish an opportunity to demonstrate the dedication and faithfulness of parishioners. Now, during his visit, Bishop Gaynor blessed the church's new Stations of the Cross and the outdoor statues of Jesus, the Blessed Virgin Mary, and St. Bernadette. St. Bernadette Parish is a mission of Our Lady of Good Counsel Parish in Marysville and date backs to 1939. The mission's church started with just holding a monthly mass in a rented storeroom. Then in 1954, the faithful built a church and it was dedicated to St. Bernadette of Lourdes. Father Dijo Thomas, pastor, praised the active congregation and their involvement in various ministries, including the Council of Catholic Women, the Knights of Columbus, the Prayer Shawl Ministry, the Choir, and the Social Committee. Well, this week we also welcomed a new Archbishop to the Archdiocese of Philadelphia. Archbishop Nelson J. Perez was installed on Wednesday at the Cathedral Basilica of Saints Peter and Paul. But we have some highlights for you from the installation mass. My brothers and sisters, I welcome all of you to the Cathedral Basilica of Saints Peter and Paul, the Mother Church of the Archdiocese of Philadelphia. This is a place of the chair, the cathedra of the Archdiocese of Philadelphia. You come from so many parts of the Archdiocese of Philadelphia, so many parishes and institutions. You come from the Diocese of Cleveland and many other parts of the United States and abroad. I welcome you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Today we recognize the providence of Almighty God to his people. The church in Philadelphia receives her new shepherd, Archbishop Nelson Perez, as the 14th Bishop and 10th Archbishop of Philadelphia. My brother priest of Philadelphia, um, you know, I've always said since I left seven and a half years ago that uh, once a Philadelphia priest, always a Philadelphia priest. And while I left ministerially, I've been saying I didn't leave humanly. And, and I followed closely. I would get all the changes, uh, all, everything that was sent to you guys in the uh, email. Now it's email. Uh, Monsignor Sullivan was gracious enough to send to me. Uh, know that I love you. I need you. I need your support. I can't do this alone. And I shouldn't do this alone. This is not about me. It's about us, right? It's about us and I need... And give these guys a round of applause for their love for you. I've chosen as a theme for, for this, this celebration of faith, uh, Jesus, hope for the world. Jesus, hope for the world. So what, what is hope and, the, and what, does, what does hope look like? What does it look like? Well, we know what the definition of hope is in, in, in like a dictionary. It's somewhat like this. A feeling of expectation, a desire for a certain thing to happen. That's the way the dictionary defines hope. And, and we also often use that word, right? We say, I hope you have a good day. I hope it doesn't rain. I hope I win the lottery. I hope the Sixers win the NBA, the Phillies the World Series, and the Eagles the Super Bowl this year, next year. Right? And, I, and, and out of great love for Cleveland, I hope that the Browns do good too. <laughs> Actually, interesting, the new coach of the Browns is from Philadelphia. Sometimes hope is just wishful thinking, right? It's just wishful thinking. I hope that I will weigh 30 pounds less in a month. Yeah. Wishful thinking. Sometimes that's what hope is. But let me talk to you about Christian hope. The hope of the Bible, the scriptures, which is actually quite different. Hope is a gift from God, given to us by God. Hope is grounded in, in Christ. It is sustained by the gift of the Spirit. It's linked to trust. It is linked to trust. Hope is the confident, the confident expectation of what God has promised. And its strength is in His faithfulness. That's hope. His stre the strength of our Christian hope is a confident expectation of what God has promised and His strength in his, is in His faithfulness. St. Paul writes that this hope doesn't disappoint. Well, we certainly welcome Archbishop Perez to his new position. It's been a busy week at the Capitol. Al Ganoza joins us with an update. Al? Hi, everybody. Al Ganoza here. I am with the Pennsylvania Catholic Conference. We are the lobbying arm of the Catholic bishops around the state of Pennsylvania. We work on a lot of issues. One of the issues that we've been working on pretty hard recently is getting local officials to accept refugees in this area. Now, I know what you're thinking, refugees, immigrants, same thing, no. In fact, when I first started working here, I didn't realize there was a difference between refugees and immigrants, there is. Now with more information on that subject is the executive director of the Pennsylvania Catholic Conference, Mr. Eric Failing. 
Eric, we have been working with uh, getting refugees uh, to this area. And uh, first of all, there's a difference between refugees and the hot button word, which is uh, immigrants. Right now. Yeah. Yeah. And there seems to be a big confusion uh, among the general public of the differences between a refugee, an asylee, an undocumented individual, um, you know, et cetera. The Catholic Charities have been working with the refugee program for, for decades. Now, a refugee is an actual legal status um, given by the United Nations. So what happens is people are generally uh, fleeing from persecution or war. Um, they're granted an official refugee status by the United Nations, and then they go to a camp and they wait, sometimes for a decade or more. Um, nations around the world uh, come together every year and they will tell the United Nations, you know, we will take in X number of refugees this year. So in our case, the president, makes the determination of how many refugees the United States will accept. Once that determination is done, um, potential refugees will then go through um, literally an, an alphabet soup list of federal agencies um, that, that uh, go through their backgrounds, do criminal background checks, biometric screens, uh, health checks, you name it. It's, it's a very, very thorough vetting process. Um, once everything is done, if they're going to be accepted, they pass all the screens or the checks and everything, uh, they then come to America. Um, they, are, they are told what country they're going to. They're told where in the country they're going to go. Then uh, an agency working with the government, such as Catholic Charities, will meet them at the airport, pick them up. We take them back to a home that we have for them, already set up, already furnished. Uh, we have a meal appropriate for their culture ready for them that night when they when they first get in. We help them with English as a second language, if, if that is necessary. Um, we get them a job. Um, like I say, we have uh, housing for them. Um, within three months, they're, they're off assistance uh, and they're on their own. Um, we will continue to help them as necessary. But what we have found is this is a, a group of individuals um, who are extremely successful in incorporating into American life. Many have started their own businesses. Um, uh, the majority of them end up uh, purchasing their own homes. So it's been a wonderful success story. Um, and we hope to continue that. And they're going by legal channels. They're doing it the right way. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, they're going through uh, through all legal channels, uh, international and, um, and American uh, law. And the interesting thing is when we ask them, uh, what is your biggest fear? in America? What, what is the thing that you're worried about the most? They say, running afoul of American law. We don't want to do anything to upset law enforcement. Um, they, they, they want this new chance. They want to succeed for themselves and for their family. Now, many of you have probably no doubt in this area heard of Representative Russ Diamond. He was a political reform advocate and a small business owner. Still is a small business owner, but he is also now a member of the House of Representatives in Harrisburg. He's very active, and one of the issues that he has been working on, well, he has a bill to change the way certain judges are elected in Pennsylvania. My bill does not regionalize the way any cases are heard, nor does it regionalize any other administrative or other case management aspect of our courts. I should also note, Mr. Speaker, <clears throat> that even though we are all elected from regional seats, we make statewide decisions every day. Right now, we, we elect all our appellate court judges in Pennsylvania. That's for the Supreme Court, the Superior Court, and the Commonwealth Court. We conduct those elections on a statewide basis. I have a constitutional amendment to change that to where we elect those judges by districts. In other words, we create seven districts for the seven Supreme Court seats, 15 for the Superior Court seats, and nine for the Commonwealth seats. And then those judges would have to live in those areas. And this is really to address a problem that's a half century uh, old where Allegheny and Philadelphia counties have utterly dominated these courts. And look, you would expect that they would have more people on those courts because those areas are more populous. But those areas contain 21.8% of the population, but they have filled almost 60% of those seats. So that's not
not really representative of all Pennsylvania. We're trying to get a little bit more regional diversity on those courts. So my constitutional amendment, which is House Bill 196, we passed it in the House. It's now in the Senate. We expect the Senate to pass it again as a constitutional amendment. Uh, it doesn't go to the governor for a signature then. We have to pass it again in the next legislative session, and then it will go on the ballot for the voters to decide whether we want to make that change or not. My outward uh, thoughts are that if, if the, the judges are coming from Philadelphia and Pittsburgh, they're more democratic, uh, and that, which is more ideology that way, and if it, it would think the Democrats would be fighting your bill. Well, uh, Democrats are opposed to because they're just looking at it like that. But there are plenty of Democrats who are sensible uh, about the law out here in, in, in the rural uh, areas of Pennsylvania as well. And that's pretty much the diversity that we're not seeing. It's not about whether it's Republican or Democrat. We've had a Republican chief justice from Philadelphia uh, on the court in recent years. So it's not about Republican and Democrat. It's about that rural vision of what the law should be versus the urban vision and what the law should be. And kind of bringing all that kind of consensus together when we get appellate court decisions, just like we have consensus here in the Capitol when we make law in the General Assembly. Uh, one other question, another subject, and you don't have to answer this, but I, I see, it seems like we have some turnover recently, people not running. Is, is it a stressful job up there? And is there like one or two things that make people think twice about going into politics? Well, you know, when you work in a legislative body of 203 members or 50 members, it's not the same as being your own boss. I have, I've been my own boss for 25 years before I came to the General Assembly. It is a different working experience when you have to come to consensus with 100 other members or 200 other members or 50 other members. It's a different process than working on your own. So I can see why a lot of people go, you know, they just pull their hair out and say, I'll never get anything done, but I'm persistent, I'll keep at it, and I'll keep trying as long as I need to. Great. Anything else you want to add or any other thing you're working on? No, that's all. God bless you all. Thank you, sir. We are seeing a fair amount of turnover at the state capitol with a number of people deciding not to run for re-election. And this is only natural. There are some 250 lawmakers at the capitol between senators and representatives. Just about all the folks around the central PA area, and I will be bummed to see many of them go, especially Representative Matt Gobbler of Clearfield County, a really good guy who has served our country overseas, as has Representative Chris Dush, really good dude also. He'll be stepping down to run for PA Auditor General. Another one I just noticed is Senator Andy Dinneman, a 75-year-old Democrat out of Chester County. He told the Daily Local News of Westchester he decided to retire shortly after his wife underwent surgery. He was first elected to the state Senate in 2006. One thing that may or may not have contributed to Denham's decision is the fact that he is facing a primary challenge from a gentleman named Kyle Boyer, a Democrat who is also the president of the Westchester NAACP. He's also a minister and a teacher. It is not overly common for an entrenched incumbent like Dinneman to get a challenge like this. And remember, the announcement of the challenge came well before the announcements of the retirements. Chester County used to be pretty heavily Republican, but that has changed over the years, as have many of the Philadelphia suburbs. There have been a few other primary challenges announced throughout Pennsylvania, including this guy, Democratic Senator Larry Farnese of Philadelphia. He's being challenged by a ward leader and an organizer named Akil Saval. Farnese is a center city attorney who's held the seat since 2009. Okay, here is a little trivia question. What political issue has been worked on the most in Harrisburg in recent years? Yeah, I don't know what the actual answer is, but I would not be surprised if it was property tax reform. Many residents despise, they can't stand the current system of school property taxes. Now lawmakers have been trying to change it for years. My buddy Frank Ryan, representative from the mid-states, well, he came up with a plan, asked some people to pay more, they didn't like it. Frank took a little bit of heat for it. Well. And it wasn't Frank's fault. Any change is going to make some people pay more than they had been paying before. Uh, Senator John DeSanto from Dauphin County recently held a, uh, a workshop to discuss the issue. He also has a plan to correct what many see as a bad situation. The purpose of this forum is to discuss and compel action on the issue of school property tax elimination. 
Pennsylvania has struggled for decades to repeal and replace this regressive and unfair tax that causes great angst and hardship for many of my constituents and everybody's constituents at this table, especially seniors living on fixed income struggling to stay in their home. Tax relief measures such as school property tax referendums Casino gaming have repeatedly fallen short of expectations and have done little to ease the burden for our state homeowners. I fully believe it's time to eliminate school property taxes as state residents can never truly own their homes without fear the government may take it from their inability to pay an ever increasing school property tax. It is for this reason I co-sponsored Senate Bill 76, a bipartisan solution which provides a path to total elimination through increased income and sales tax. Time for an update now, a story the PCC has been watching for several months. Uh, Governor Tom Wolf recently vetoed Senate Bill 906, which would put, put a moratorium on the closing of two state centers for those with severe disabilities. The bill would have blocked the closure of any state center for at least five years and taken the power to close any such facility out of the governor's hands. The PCC supported the measure and was disappointed in the governor's veto. Uh, we support home and community based care and for individuals to receive the best care possible in the environment of their choosing. But we are worried about whether that will happen in this case without proper safeguards in place. The governor said in a statement, these centers are large institutions that are costly to maintain and do not promote community living. Several lawmakers have been critical of the governor all along the process of these closures, most notably being fellow Democrat Representative Gerald Mullery of Luzerne County, the Whitehaven centers in his district. He said in a statement to issue this callous veto in the face of the recent Office of Inspector General report, it's nothing more than repulsive. He goes on to say Governor Wolf appears more interested in saving face with interest groups like the ARC than ensuring the safety and well-being of these centers. His citation of cost savings is disgusting. Mullery continued, this cannot be the end. The voiceless need our representation now more than ever. I will do everything in my power to secure enough votes to override this inhumane veto. All right, I hope the, uh, the time we have spent together just now has been at least a little bit informative. Thanks for joining us. I'm Al Ganoza with the Pennsylvania Catholic Conference. Well, thanks, Al. That does it for us, and we hope you enjoyed this week's show. To learn more about the Pennsylvania Catholic Conference and the Diocese of Harrisburg, please visit pacatholic.org and hbgdiocese.org. From all of us at the Diocese and the Catholic Conference, thank you for watching and have a great week.